Yes. Oh, I know. I mean, I'm going to talk over here. Don't worry about that. Check, check. Daddy gets to have it now. Okay, get back to him. I got one already. It's right there. Thank you. But put it in your Come on up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, it'll just, it'll just plug in. And what is it? So, yeah. yeah, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to talk on it. I've got one, see? The one's right here. Why is yours right there? Because it's a tiny one. You've got the bigger one. Yeah. You've got the big one. Okay. That will work. Jump. Okay, keep jumping. Ready? Can you spin around? <laughs> jump, jump, jump. Spin, spin, spin. Spin, spin. I don't know. What you, you are holding the microphone. Are you making I'm everybody holding, laugh? Actually, I am, am, am just talking in it because, um. Hi. Ready, set, spin around? No, he's still working on it. What's Chance going to help with? He's not going to do anything. He's just going to lie. Yeah, they're, they're my warm-up act, actually, is what it is for an hour. Yeah. So, yeah. <sighs> what kind of scotch is this, by the way? It's really good. This spot at yours. Oh, okay. Do this. Okay. Yeah. Wait a minute. No, 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 up here. Up here. Back up. <laughs> Yes. Are you talking to me? Okay, Storm, you're done, man. <laughs> go sit with Grandma. Go. We're filming? No, I'm okay. I'm good. Go ahead. Go see, go see Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're done, man. You're done. Why is that so funny? There you go. Or you can sit right here. You want to sit right here? Have a seat right here. Yeah, sit. I'm there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'll let you know when it's time. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoyed your little break there. We can all feel a little healthier now, as it is a little known fact that Drew Curtis is the cure for the common cold. After being the first internet star to swim the Panama Canal, Drew set out to make great advances in the field of transhuman power dynamic flight. He arrived at this particular event in usual dramatic fashion on the backs of 17 radioactive pink elephants. In the process, he overloaded all the television transmitters in a three mile radius. Ladies and gentlemen, Drew Curtis. Thank you. So like I mentioned before, we just kind of uh, put this together here on the fly. And, uh, it actually will be uh, completely indistinguishable from other uh, preparations you see. It's uh, pretty much the same stuff. Uh, however, uh, so the talk today is about uh, mainstream media and what happened. And I'm using the past tense because it's actually already done. Uh, more about that when I get to the other talk. Uh, first of all, to give you some kind of background on what happened to mainstream media, we need to talk about what newspapers were like 50 years ago. Revenues came from three different sources. They came from classifieds. It came from subscriptions and direct sales ads. Now, classified ads were the kind of the core of the newspaper, even during a bad downturn when you like we're experiencing right now. Classified ads are still there because people need to sell furniture and you know hot dogs and whatever else that they put on classified. Uh, subscription revenues, most people don't realize, it pretty much existed from the beginning in order to offset the cost of printing the newspaper. Uh, it wasn't until USA Today in the mid-80s came out and started charging a godly sum of 50 cents a newspaper that somebody decided to try to make ongoing revenue off of it. Uh, the real meat of the uh, industry, though, is direct sales ads. And direct sales ads were basically where you have a salesperson that either goes out and finds clients or the clients come into the shop and they buy them from you. Now, all of these things, things combined to a profit margin of about 40% at the time. Which obviously is really good. To give you guys a kind of a, a, a range of profit margins, uh, Walmart's profit margin is less than one half of 1%. Most uh, highly competitive industries are one, maybe two if you're lucky. 40% pretty freaking good. Sure, yeah, hit me. There you go. There you go. Terrific. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go down a little timeline of stuff that occurred that eventually sank the newspapers, and some of it's obvious and some of it isn't. And the first thing that we're going to talk about 
uh, is actually a little surprising because it doesn't seem like it would cause the industry any grief. In fact, it seems like it would cause the opposite. Uh, 30 years ago, the FCC under Reagan approves deregulation. Now, deregulation has uh, got kind of a bad connotation to it. In this particular case, uh, it was good for the newspapers in the sense that it finally allowed one newspaper to own an entire market and in some cases buy or merge with their competitor. Up until this time, pretty much every uh, major U.S. city and most small ones had at least two competing newspapers, sometimes three or four. And after deregulation went through, a lot of these merged, and so that's why you see a lot of newspapers with hyphenated names, like the Times Leader. Or I'm from Lexington, Kentucky, where we have the Herald Leader. It was two separate papers that merged together when they were allowed to because they were allowed to effectively become monopolies. Now, that seems like a really good thing, and it kind of was because being a monopoly is great. It's actually the first rule of business. If you can become a monopoly, do it. Uh, however, the problem was with being a monopoly is, is that that pretty much brings innovation to a complete screeching halt. You stop attempting to innovate, you stop attempting to compete. And this was the first uh, thing that happened, and probably the most damning thing that happened to the media is that they eventually they decided to stop competing. They owned their own local markets. The only way you could get the news was through them, and there was no competition period. It was, it, it was them or nobody. TV news didn't particularly count because you only had to catch TV news if you didn't have a VCR at 5.30 for local and 6.30 for national, and other than that, that was it. Fifteen years ago, the next uh, nail in the coffin was the World Wide Web arriving. Uh, that pretty much says it all. Initially, it didn't actually have any net impact. It was what happened down the road. Uh, this right here actually is a, uh, a, a graph of the way revenues would be going. The idea is that if you drew a line through it, you'd see like a slow decline. You notice there's uh, two big uh, downward spikes right there, recessions. Uh, it's interesting to note, though, that there wasn't that much of a big one in uh, 1982, which is kind of a shocker because that was a pretty bad recession, but it, it did spike downwards in the other two. Now, the advent of the Internet, like I said, in and of itself didn't have any impact. It was down the road later on. Um, some newspapers did get online early. Uh, USA Today actually jumped online pretty quickly, and I suspect part of the reason it did was because they were actually in competition with other people and they were trying to be a little more nimble. Uh, CNN was also on there at the time, and uh, most other people had token presences, but that was about the extent of it. Uh, the next, uh, the next mile marker, the late 90s, uh, is when you start first seeing mainstream media articles noting that 25-year-olds have stopped picking up news subscriptions. Now, this was treated as some kind of a weird, oh, my God, this is an amazing thing. I saw a great clip of uh, Bill O'Reilly when he was on um, Current Affair or E or whatever it was, the extra that he was on back in 1987 where they did a little expose on what is Nintendo, all the crazy kids are into it. And essentially, these articles that start showing up around this time are the same thing about these, these crazy kids they're not picking up newspaper subscriptions. You know, the, the conclusion was basically that eventually these guys are going to figure it out that they need to have a newspaper subscription and would go on. But it's, it's, another, it's another mile marker that, that piles on later on. The next thing that happened that wasn't immediately obviously a big problem for newspapers was in the late 90s when Craigslist launches. When Craigslist gets going, uh, that initially had no impact whatsoever on newspapers, but later ended up being a huge, huge deal. In 2000, we had the uh, dot-com crash. Now, the impact of the dot-com crash was actually on newspapers was not significantly dangerous. Uh, however, what it did do was is it, it absolutely annihilated online advertising revenue for five years, which basically gave them no particular reason to attempt to innovate in this field. There was no money in it, and there wasn't going to be any money in it for quite a while. And so, as a result, people they kind of just wrote off the entire online space and said, the heck with it. Ta-da. This is the uh, graveyard of uh, companies that died and uh, one of them that survived amazingly. Now, in the early 2000s, you start seeing new articles appearing, which sound kind of like the same old articles, which is uh, in the early 2000s, now they're writing articles that people in their 30s and under are not getting newspaper subscriptions anymore. Uh, again, uh, nobody really drawing the conclusion that it's uh, actually it's not new people that are dropping subscriptions. It's actually the same people they were talking about five years ago that just got older. Now, this, however, has been a long enough time to where newspapers actually have noticed that there's a bit of a pattern going on here, but they uh, have some kind of strange reactions to this, especially since in the early 2000s, as I mentioned before, the dot-com bust is in full effect. So there's no revenue justification for going online and trying to have some kind of a presence because there's no money to be gotten. Uh, and, however, though it is obviously impacting subscriptions, so if you're mainstream media, what do you do? Well, they, they reached some interesting conclusions. Um, one of them was is that they decided that they needed to uh, put all of their content behind registration walls. 
Now, that was actually happened for two reasons, uh, both of which were not necessarily intuitive. The first one was, I found this out when I was in an AP Managing Editors conference in, uh, in Tampa in 2002, uh, was because the only way they could actually make money on online content was by selling email addresses. And uh, now they weren't doing this underhandedly. They weren't uh, taking everybody who signed up for registration and saying, now we're going to sell these guys to spam lists. But they were making a quarter a pop per sale off of these things. And I remember in being, sitting in on a registration talk at the AP Managing Editors Conference where the general gist of it is you should all do this as soon as possible because we're making tons of money. And somebody asked the question. They said, um, if somebody opts out of all the lists that we try to sign them up for when they sign up for registration, then what value uh, is that customer to us? And the answer was none whatsoever. The second reason they wanted to do the registration, though, was because it essentially put up a gate, a walled gate, that would allow you, if, if they decided at some point that the market had changed in such a way, to flip the switch and make that a, a, a toll. Start charging for the content. Basically feed everybody through the registration system so at the, some future date when we all start charging for online news subscriptions that we can just flip the switch and, and bang, off we go. Interestingly, uh, this didn't work out too well for them because uh, at the end of the day, what killed it was Google News came along, and it turned out that Google News would, uh, if you had a registration wall up, would skip around you. Uh, the, the longest holdout on this actually ended up being the uh, New York Times. They, they lasted longer than anybody else. Uh, and finally switched over because they were not showing up in Google News searches for anything because they were automatically being dropped to the bottom. Something else interesting that came up at that, uh, that news conference that I mentioned, by the way, is that uh, we were, uh, were having breakout sessions talking about the, uh, the issue with uh, dropping, uh, dropping newspaper revenue and what to do about it. And I was just, I'm just a novice. I'm just sitting out there. I still pretty much am. I don't own a news company or anything like that. And uh, so one of the talks was about what uh, should, can we do about this dropping revenue. In 2002, they knew they had, their revenue had been dropping. And so I, you know, they were obviously very concerned. So I became very concerned. And I was like, you know, man, this sounds like it's a big problem. I hadn't really heard about this before. I was like, um, but then it occurred to me to ask, uh, what, what did your revenues drop to and from? And they said, well, they used to be 40% profit margins. Now they're, they're 20. I'm like, 20% profit margin? That's pretty freaking good. I don't you guys crying about. I don't understand at all. Uh, so, uh, but it was interesting that at least they had, they had noticed in 2002, and again, that's another, another signpost right there. Um, another interesting thing that happened around then as well was I was coming into contact with people who were in charge of the digital divisions of their respective newspapers. And at the time, the way these were set up was is it would be like The Sun in London would have two guys that did the website, the end, period. And so it was kind of an afterthought. We ought to be doing this. It was kind of like assigning somebody to cover, you know, the local city council. And uh, those guys basically had no support. They were kind of ignored. They didn't particularly care. They weren't, they were under no illusions about what they were doing. But in 2002, uh, there started being internal discussions about whether or not uh, these online divisions internal to the newspaper should be completely eliminated. We should just get off the internet altogether. And it was interesting because they had actually reached the correct conclusion. Uh, the correct conclusion was is that our, these online news sites are killing our subscriptions. Well, they certainly were, but not individually. It wasn't the online guys that we have down the hall. It wasn't their fault. It was the collective news industry putting all of this stuff online. And it, there actually was no way to put the, pull the genie back uh, in the bottle, but they were still having issues. Like, literally, the guys over at the Sun were in a knockdown dragout fight one day where the legacy guys were attempting to pull all their funding and shut them down. It was very bizarre. Uh, but that was uh, in 2002. Now, uh, in 2005, the next milepost that we hit is MySpace buys Fox, or it gets bought by Fox, rather. And what happens is, is that uh, somebody, th the minute that this thing happens, it's kind of a shot across the bow to everybody else. But nobody's really sure exactly what's happened. Uh, what's happened is, is that Rupert Murdoch, who is a very smart man, has bought a very large media property for what was thought to be, at the time, way too much money. But nobody assumed that he was an idiot. So therefore, the assumption has to be, well, what's he doing? What's, what's his play? Now, what he actually did was he inadvertently kicked off the uh, dot-com 2.0 boom. And I don't mean from a technological sense. I mean from a crazy bubble sense. Because the minute that it became, this was the, uh, the signpost that said that you know, crazy valuations are back quick. Everybody make a website and sell it for as much as you possibly can. And uh, many people over the last four years successfully did that. But what this did was is it told all the other media companies who had basically either been actively trying to kill their own online divisions or had no plan whatsoever or had been ignoring the entire market segment for five years that maybe 
they should get something going. Because Rupert Murdoch obviously thinks that everything's going to be moving online. And of course, he would tell anybody who asked that's what was going on. So everybody decided, OK, well, now we need to make a big online push and see what we can do. In the late 2000s, we start seeing uh, other new articles showing up. Uh, mainstream media has now noticed that 35-year-olds are no longer picking up subscriptions. They're still talking about the same people. Uh, but they, it is still continuing. And now at this point, they've decided that if you're 35 years old and you haven't picked up a newspaper subscription, you're probably not going to. And uh, they start to go into full-on panic mode. Now here's where this all comes together. Two years ago, 2007, revenues now come from three sources. Or rather, they did. <laughs> the three sources were, as we mentioned before, classifieds were, as I mentioned, they were the keystone of the, the revenue relationship internal to newspapers. Classified, Craig Newmark totally absorbed it, wiped them out, wiped out the core foundation that newspapers survived on. Now, if that was the only thing that had just left, they might have been able to limp along a little bit, but then as we already mentioned, subscriptions, you know, completely out the window. The, the subscription readership is literally dying out from underneath the media guys, literally dying, because that's what's actually eliminating them from the population. It isn't that people are getting rid of their newspaper subscriptions if they're 55 and they've had them their entire lives, they're still reading the newspaper. But, What's happening is, is that as the, their, their pool is shrinking, and it's obvious that no new 18-year-olds are going to be running out to get the newspaper anytime soon. And the third problem, and this is the biggest problem, is direct sales ads uh, basically completely dry up. Now, the direct sales ads is a little bit complicated, and it's a little bit complicated because there, a, a major shift occurs when print goes online, and it's complicated from three different ways. First of all, uh, news consumption patterns have changed now from what they used to be. Uh, from the way the advertisers consider it. For example, if you used to go buy Newsweek, uh, the way that the advertisers and the media buyers considered you consumed Newsweek was if you bought it, you consumed every ad that was in there. Now, nobody really believed that you did that, but that's how they counted it for terms of figuring out how many ads got served out versus how many people bought the, bought the magazine, et cetera, and so on. The problem is, is that when you go online, the way people consume news is nobody goes to time.com every week and reads the entire freaking thing top to bottom. You basically go there, or in most cases, you don't even go there to start. You start in a news aggregator or somewhere else that happened to link to a couple articles that you think are cool, and you read those. And then you're in, and then you're out. Now, what this does is this has a dramatic impact on the amount of advertising inventory available, because now you're not consuming the entire Time magazine. You went to two articles, and then you got out. And so all of these other potential ad impressions basically never got dinged. The second problem you have is that they have been massively overselling the effectiveness of online advertising, or advertising in general, for that matter. Uh, in 1997, I was running an ISP in Lexington, Kentucky, and I ended up trying to purchase some advertising space out of the local newspaper, and they said to me that the advertising response rate would be roughly 4% of everybody that this ad was put in front of would respond to it. Now, I didn't know. I thought, oh, that sounds pretty good. Why does everybody not advertise in the newspaper? This doesn't make any sense at all. But we took out an ad, and... It's hard to say because the way that they come back on you when you don't get any obvious leads is they say, well, people saw the ad and they signed up, but they didn't tell you that that's where they saw the ad. That's what's going on. And you go, oh, okay, sure, I guess that's probably what's happening. However, online, uh, you can measure. You can actually see, you can see exactly who clicked the ad. You can see whether or not they acted on it. And it turns out that these numbers tell us that the actual action rate on ads online is 0.2%, not 4%, 0.2%. And you can't lie about that as an ad sales guy. 0.2% is what the stats say. And that's like on a good ad. The bad ones are worse. So you can't upsell that by saying, oh, well, you know, uh, they just lied when they clicked on that. No, the numbers don't lie. They basically said. So that they, their initial story became internet advertising isn't as effective as print. Therefore, you need to make a bigger print buy. Let's do that. And then you'll be fine. But uh, the other problem you've got is, is that as we already mentioned, we've got lower inventory because uh, people are not consuming as many news articles. They're getting a couple and they're getting out. You've got dramatically reduced rates by a factor of 20. And then on top of that, hey, guess what? Everybody's online. Now every local monopoly that had been existing like that for 30 years is now in direct competition with each other globally across the world. And uh, they still haven't actually worked that one out, but it's, uh, that one, that's the least of their problems at this stage. But the upshot of it is, is that they were in direct competition with each other and didn't realize it. So, for example, the impact that would have. Uh, Lexington Herald Leader used to carry a lot more international news on the main page. Now they're making the assumption that you got it from somewhere else, and you probably did. So today, uh, or two years ago, rather, I should say profit margins are non-existent. Now, notice that I said two years ago. And the reason that it is two years ago is because actually that's when that, that went through. You'll notice that today, Practically, 
every major newspaper company is bankrupt, like right now. And the only ones that aren't are going to be soon. And to give you an example, uh, the New York Times recently uh, did something really dumb. They, uh, they ended up uh, taking a, uh, their building that they have owned in downtown Manhattan, a very prime piece of real estate that they've owned for quite a while, and they sold it. They sold it in order to make money to make interest payments on their pre-existing debt. Uh, to put that in more simple terms, that's like uh, if you have racked up a massive credit card debt that you're absolutely suffering from, that's like selling your house to make the minimum payment that month. That's what they did last month. It's probably not going to work out as well for uh, them as it would work out for any of us that tried that as well. Uh, basically, uh, all of these guys are pretty much the walking dead. And by the walking dead, I don't just mean like bankruptcy where they go and they toss off their debt and they reorganize like every airline's been. I mean, they're being liquidated, completely liquidated down. The first one to go is the Rocky Mountain News about a month and a half ago. The second one was the Seattle Post Intelligencer. Both of those are never coming back. Uh, looks like the next major one on deck that we know of is probably the Boston Globe. The New York Times owns it and uh, says that they're basically in so much debt that there's no way they're ever going to be able to reorganize this thing in order to get their money back. So they're just going to basically just let it float and send it down off to its own death. Uh, obviously, the Bostonites are not pleased about that. But you know, there's, again, there's not a whole lot that can be done. And that, oh, by the way, won't be the end. Uh, my prediction is that probably every single mid-market daily out there in existence is going to go this route, with a few exceptions. Now, the question would be is, uh, so going back to the initial, to sum up what we've learned so far, what killed mainstream media? Well, basically it was not paying attention because as we've already established through going through the timeline of what's been going on over the last 30 years, these trends were fairly obvious and they have not changed in a while. Uh, subscription rates have been dropping for 15 years. Revenues have been dropping for 15 years. Now, the reason that these guys are going bankrupt is because they basically they saw these numbers. The people in charge of these organizations did see what was going on, but they chose to ignore them for whatever reason. They, they, they were just basically, they thought they could not believe what they were seeing. It is truly astounding to me that in the face of all this data, nobody actually did anything at all. They just decided to, oh, maybe we'll fire 10% uh, of our workforce, which is an extreme amount, by the way, but it needs to be a lot more people. And I'll give you a local example. Lexington Hair Leader in my market has currently 400 employees. I have no idea what those guys are doing. I have no clue. Because 95% of the newspaper is wire service. The other 5% is uh, Kentucky basketball, and then after that, you've got about eh, the occasional high school sports, uh, one move, movie and restaurant review a week, and they got 400 guys working over there that are, I don't know what they're doing, uh, but I'll tell you what they, one thing they are doing is they're taking home a check every month and eating up this rapidly diminishing pool of revenue. And in the meantime, it's obvious where this is going to go, and people are just continuing. Like, for example, uh, going back to the Rocky Mountain Daily News example, when they announced that they were going to close it, they announced that they were going to liquidate it immediately. Normally, you take a, a second step. You go bankrupt, attempt to reorganize, fail, then liquidate, uh, like uh, what happened with FAO Schwartz a few years ago. But in this particular case, what happened was is they realized they took one look at the books and said, there is no way under any circumstances we're going to be able to pull revenue out of this thing in order to be able to bring it back, and so we're going to dissolve it. And uh, that's pretty much what's going to happen. Now, it's fairly obvious now that this is all going on for the most part, although you will still find people that consider this to be a temporary downturn. They literally think at some point, like, it's just the bad economy we're going through currently. As soon as this bad economy goes away, all this revenue is going to come up out of nowhere, and we're going to be unicorns farting rainbows and all kinds of awesome stuff. Well, uh, that's obviously not going to happen. And some people, however, have, uh, have kind of figured it out. Uh, in particular, uh, there was a meeting about two to three weeks ago uh, at another AP managing editors conference or one of the other AP conferences that they have on a regular basis. And it was a fairly fascinating meeting. They had a bunch of heads of these media companies, some bankrupt, most bankrupt, some not, to get together and discuss behind a closed door what they were going to do about it. In order to make sure there was no collusion, they decided to get an independent attorney in the room in order to watch over them. Uh, I actually kind of call bullshit on that. There's no actual independent attorney. Somebody paid for that guy, and whoever paid for that guy to be there is the one that owned him. And my guess is it's probably the Associated Press. But that being said, a discussion occurred, and in the last two weeks, some very interesting things started happening, uh, which is, uh, especially considering what I do, is interesting keeping an eye on. Uh, the first thing that happened was is that uh, we started seeing, uh, well, I mean, and before this, we started seeing pieces trying to tie the death of journalism to the death of newspapers as if they are intimately related. Yes, newspapers hire journalists, but if newspapers go away, journalism does not necessarily disappear. In fact, my contention is, is that it won't. Uh, the second thing interesting you see happening in the last couple of weeks is all of a sudden there's been a, quite a few hit pieces going out after Google News and Craigslist out of nowhere. The Google News one, there was a great one by uh, Maureen Dowd that came out last week, which is absolutely hysterically funny. 
uh, to read, where she goes in and talks about how awesome Google is, and they've got you know, piles of wheatgrass everywhere, and everybody's happy and employed. And, but, but who knew that Google News was killing newspapers? And they go in, and she, she basically hits Eric Schmidt in an interview about this, and I think he's confused that he's even being asked these questions. Uh, but uh, basically, it's, it's a hilarious piece, and Gawker did a great write-up on it last week. I saw one last night in the bar that was even funnier because it does resemble something that we've all seen before. Uh, the one in the bar was, it was called uh, the, the, uh, the Death of Craigslist, which you automatically know that's going to be a good article. And basically what it was saying was is that uh, there are, Craigslist revenue is mostly made up of uh, ads for call girls and uh, other kinds of hookers. And uh, so the, 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 the local law enforcement is catching on to this and it's going to wipe out Craigslist when all this revenue vanishes. Never mind the fact that they may get my $5 million a year on 50 employees, but that's going to probably wipe them out somehow. So uh, it's interesting because it resembles the, all the conversations you saw starting to happen about MySpace about six months after Fox picked it up, in particular all the uh, MySpace predators out there. Anybody seen any pieces on Facebook predators or AOL predators or any other kind of predators? It's always on MySpace for some reason. Wow, what a coincidence that is. Uh, so I think that I, part of what they were discussing about what to do about the Craigslist was attack the sex angle, in particular because uh, anytime you write about sex and horrors and whatnot in, uh, in nudity in newspapers, it draws a ton of traffic, so that's not a bad thing either. About two weeks ago, there was a funny article that came out uh, also on Gawker because they're tracking this about uh, a local radio station in Nashville that got a cease and desist from uh, the AP based on uh, they, uh, they had been embedding AP video onto the site and one of the attorneys from the law firm that they hired retained to, to check on this had given them a C&D saying, take this stuff down. But the reason this was funny was because this, this video came from YouTube, YouTube's AP feed, the one that the AP set up themselves and puts their own video on so people can embed them on local radio sites in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, so, you know, that one got thrown out. But the, what the interesting thing is, is it's not necessarily that article but it's the broader picture. And that is, is that I very much do not believe for a minute that the AP only sent one C&D out two weeks ago. They probably sent out hundreds. Now, I haven't seen it where any of the other ones ended up or landed or what the ramifications are. I do know from talking to uh, friends of mine at the Daily Coast that they did not get one because they are dying to get one. They can't wait. They are ready. They want the publicity. They are just dying for it. But I'll tell you who probably did get one last week uh, is the Huffington Post. And it's for uh, what the AP calls content scraping. And uh, I'm going to give you a little example of what content scraping is. This is from the Huffington Post, uh, April 18th. Uh, well, it was today. So there was this, this article was March 27th, so about three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, the Smoking Gun did a great article on the uh, Sham Wow guy. I don't know if you guys saw, but he got, apparently, sometime in February, he got punched in the face by a stripper or a hooker. Yeah, there you go, or something. And uh, he ended up uh, getting a bloody face, and he got his mug shot because he got arrested, and it was, it was classic. Well, what we're looking at here is this is the Huffington Post article on what happened with the smoking gun. And in particular, you notice what we've got here is we've got, see, it's obviously, they, they do credit the smoking gun, so that's nice. And they also mention right out here, so you got this little tiny paragraph. It's actually one sentence. It says, according to the smoking gun. Now, what we've got down here below is you've got that little bit here where it's basically browned out. Do we have anything below that, or is that just a still? That's okay. Now, what happens is behind, the whole rest of this continues down below on the page. They scraped everything, copy, paste, dump, into that article on the Huffington Post. And then there's a small blurb at the end of the Huffington Post about, ha ha, that Shamwell guy, what a, what a funny dude. And that's what the AP is talking about, about scraping content. The Huffington Post actually does this to generate content, for, and it works a couple of ways. It's great for SEO. It's absolutely fantastic, as it turns out. Uh, and in particular, uh, it also uh, ends up, uh, in some cases, on the Google News searches, jumps in front of the actual original article themselves. In fact, oftentimes it does, because the Huffington Post, if they're good at anything, is fantastic at SEO. They're great. So good that they can usurp the original article. The AP obviously has a problem with this, because uh, it's basically preventing outbound clicks from arriving. They would not particularly care if there was a pass-through click, if there was a small summary. Uh, that said, hey, check out this article on the smoking gun. It's hilarious. You've got to read it. And maybe even a small summary that says the ShamWow got arrested. Go check out his mugshot. The AP would actually be perfectly okay with that. They have no trouble with it. However, the AP is also a large, stupid organization. And they tend to go a little too far. And in particular, they went after uh, somebody else for a 37-word summary. And that became an interesting controversy on the Internet when they did that, which was basically is... Where is the line? Uh, can you scrape 37 words of content out of an AP article? Or what is it? Is it 10? Or is it 50? Where's the line? Uh, I use that example because 
I don't really know where the line is myself. I do know it's not the entire goddamn article. I'm pretty sure it's, that's not that big. But that's about to be decided because the AP is going to make an example of someone. And right now we have some very distressed Web 2.0 properties that are making a ton of traffic off of intercepting outbound links. And another one recently started doing it about a week ago. And you may have heard of it. It's called Dig. You guys know the Dig Bar? You guys know what I'm talking about? Now, everybody's really annoyed by that thing. I, I, me, I don't particularly care about it, but I think it's more interesting to discuss why there's a Dig Bar up there. Now, the theory is, is that, oh, it'll make it easier for you guys to dig this story. We did it for you. We always do things for you. Because, you know, I mean, as somebody who runs a similar company, we never do anything for you guys, just so you all know. Nothing at all. And uh, basically, uh, what happened was is that the reason they do that is because that little tiny frame up at the top, that registers an outbound click on their site for purposes of uh, tracking traffic. Uh, Comscore and Nielsen picked that up as an outbound click on themselves. Now, to give you an example of what that would do for FARC if we did that, we currently get 65 million page views a month. If we recaptured all our outbound traffic, we would double our traffic. We would go up to 130 million. And I guarantee you Dig's probably got something similar going on. Now, that's an obvious temptation. Uh, the second problem, though, that you're going to have is that there are two unintended side effects of framing an article below a little piece of content. And the two unintended, very dangerous side effects for Dig, and they're going to find out here pretty soon, is one, uh, that erases the Comscore tracking for the news site that they linked to. Now, all of the traffic that Dig actually sends is not being counted by Comscore for that target site. It's being counted for Dig. Because Comscore basically has assumed that people are going to attempt to do fake traffic things, and this is one of the things people have tried in the past. So Comscore basically assigns it to whoever the first thing that loaded up was, and in this case, it's the Dig Bar. Dig Bar gets all the outbound traffic. Online, online organization that receives the traffic will still see traffic on their end, but it won't get counted for statistical purposes towards their site where it counts. And Comscore is what advertisers use to decide who they advertise. And what you're going to see within about a month or two is people are going to start looking at their numbers. And across all of the sites in, in mainstream media in the world, they're going to see a drop. And that drop is going to be directly attributed to the fact that they've lost their dig traffic. They're still getting it, but they're not getting it counted towards them. And the second problem is, is that a lot of ad servers also do not count that traffic. And that's going to be the biggest problem of all, is that eventually they will stop rendering direct sale ads, which are the most expensive ads you could possibly sell, against content run up against the dig bar or whatever other kind of bar that ends up coming. And interestingly, it is interesting to point out that this was tried 10 years ago, and the company that did it was sued out of existence. Um, so whether or not that's going to happen with dig going forward, I don't really know. But it, that's, uh, that has yet to come down the pike, because I think it's been 10 years and everybody forgot what the impact of that was. So the AP is going to make an example out of somebody. I expect pretty soon, they probably already have. I'm sure they've set some cease and desist over to the Huffington Post that they're not going to be able to comply with. And uh, I think we're going to find out the rest of that story sometime in the next month. So to, in conclusion, what's going on with the mainstream media right now? They're basically dead, and they already, they already and they don't know it. And they're just trying to function along. Uh, they've racked up too much debt. They will never, ever recover from the damage they've already done to themselves. They are pretty much toast, kaput, ex parrot ex media, so on and so forth. <laughs> so what's next? <laughs> yeah, you better catch up on that one because I didn't know who this was either. So anyway, what's next? You're not seeing a whole lot of articles about what's next. Yeah, and it actually might be a Lowell Cats now that I think about it. But What's next for mainstream media? Nobody's actually talking about that because nobody really wants to conceive of the fact that there may be a future without a lot of mid-market dailies running around. Um, I have a feeling that as far as media consolidation goes, you're going to see two or three national players pop out. It's going to be Fox, it's going to be CNN, it's going to be the AP in some form. Uh, the AP has been trying to cannibalize traffic to themselves off of their partner sites for a long time now. Uh, and then after that, I'm not 100% sure uh, who else is going to be left standing at the national level. Uh, what, however, is going to happen at the mid-market and local level is fairly interesting. About three weeks ago, I got invited out to the Pointer Institute to talk about ostensibly the impact of uh, the Web 2.0 on democracy or some really vague topic like that. But all anybody wanted to talk about was why media was going to be dying. And there were a couple of interesting talks that was, were given there. One in particular was by a guy who runs the Chi Town Daily News. I don't know if anybody here is from Chicago or not. Uh, but if you are, you may have heard of these guys. Uh, they get some reasonable press occasionally. And what these guys have done is very interesting. They set up with about a $400,000 initial investment. They hired five investigative reporters who put together essentially a blog and do nothing but show up at local council meetings or school board meetings or planning and zoning or all that boring crap that when the media started cutting guys, that's who they fired first because nobody reads this crap. And they send them out there to cover that stuff. 
because as it turns out, you don't need this massive infrastructure to do journalism. You just need a journalist and some place to put this stuff later when he brings it back to you. And what they've done is they've also done this, interestingly, in a nonprofit format. Now, there's two interesting ramifications. The first one is, is that uh, the guy who runs it anticipates that if for about one to two million dollars, you could probably reconstruct the uh, journalistic effectiveness equivalent of any mid-market daily in the entire United States, period, with about two million dollars, and that would be enough to set them up, hire the guys, get it going, and then exist on an ongoing basis. And I expect we're going to see a lot of that in the near future. However, what he does say is that after their experience of setting this up as a nonprofit, that he says that's absolutely not the way to do it, as it turns out. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, part of it is because of nonprofit restrictions, but the other problem is, is that going out and getting um, donations. Uh, he says the pool of available charity money for nonprofit anything is not particularly large. And currently, there is no pool of money in existence for media as a donation in order to keep them going. Now, NPR does pretty good, but they don't receive, like they're doing their little fundraisers and whatnot. They're actually not attempting to contact massive donors and get these massive amount of grants and to continue to function. And basically, uh, he says that it's essentially a non-starter for one of the things that mainstream media has sort of attempted to do here recently, which was, I don't know if you guys caught about a month and a half ago, where uh, somebody in Congress attempted to file a bill to make it easier for existing news properties to convert to nonprofit status. Now, uh, that happened while I was out at this conference, and the guy basically read the entire bill, and he said, this is absolutely not going to do what they think it will do. And he was thinking that the reason that every, the news media is so excited about this nonprofit status for themselves is that they are confusing nonprofit status with not making any money. It's not the same thing. Uh, nonprofits still need to make money in order to be able to operate. Nonprofit has just got to, it makes it a little bit easier to exist and, and basically do stuff in kind of a little bit of a vacuum without all of the problems you've got running ads against your content. But uh, if you're actually not making any money and you're losing it like crazy, converting to nonprofit status is of no use whatsoever and it'll probably just make you die faster. Now, Chi-Town Daily News had some interesting ideas and I actually expect to see this happen kind of organically in other markets uh, across the United States. And in particular, I think the first place we're going to see this happen, and I, this is just a complete guess on my part, by the way, but I, I bet I'm, we're going to see it, is I, I think the Rocky Mountain News is going to come back in some form or another. Uh, again, two, one or two million dollars, Hire the five or ten best journalists who still live in the area, by the way, and wouldn't mind being employed again. Buy the domain name, get some air on chairs, a little office space, off you go. You've got the Rocky Mountain News again. And it will actually operate about as well as the original Rocky Mountain News did. And all you've got to do to compensate for the stuff you don't have is buy a bunch of wire service articles, fill in your extra space, off you go. And you can make not killer money at it, but you can do pretty good. Uh, and I expect you're going to see a bunch of guys pop up. And in particular, uh, the model for success that I am seeing pop up is uh, happening at the super local level. I think everybody uh, who lives in a reasonably sized city has a super local. Uh, in Lexington, where we live, uh, there's a number of them actually owned by the same guy. It started out as a paper called the Chevy Chaser, which was about one local newspaper, li little neighborhood, but expanded to cover eventually South Lexington and then eventually the entire city, and now he's got a local business one going and a bunch of other stuff. And this guy's making a lot of money. And what he did was, is he's not all online, he's doing print, but what he did was, he built this thing from the ground up. Rather than having 150 years of legacy whatever that he had to support on top of 30 years of being a monopoly and basically funding people not do anything all day long, he didn't have a lot of money to do this. And so he hired one or two guys, started doing a good job, put out good content, got his paper going, got his ads going, built that up very slowly over time. And now what this guy is doing, and I expect this is going in other markets as well, he is poaching every single good writer locally that he's ever wanted to have. He can get all of them as it turns out. Even if the newspaper hasn't gone bankrupt yet, uh, everybody in journalism still feels like they're about to lose their jobs. So if you come along and you say, hey, uh, you know, you're probably about to lose your job, would you like one? They, they jump ship all day long. So he's looting his local newspaper for all of the talent. So by the time these guys go under, all of the actual good investigative journalists that we're all worried about losing are going to be signed on somewhere else by the time that thing goes kapoof. And uh, he's doing really well. This is happening all over, all, all over the country. There is another guy, there's, uh, the, the biggest guy I read about was somebody up in uh, it's either Portland or Seattle who owns 200 alt-weeklies uh, all across the Pacific Northwest, and he's making a mint, making an absolute ton of money because it's one of those things that scales up as you go. Now, uh, you're also going to see uh, the blogosphere, uh, obviously, is going to pick up a little bit of this slack as well, independent people. But I think it's going to change a little bit based on what's going to happen with this upcoming scraping controversy. I don't know where this is going to land exactly, but the scraping issue, whatever this ends up being, 
And it has to be watched very closely because I don't trust the AP to come up with the right thing. They're eventually going to try to take every inch of ground they can and then assume that if they get fought back off of it a little bit, then that's okay at the end of the day. I don't know what they're going to ask for, but I don't believe for a minute that the first thing they ask for is going to be anything reasonable. And uh, the blogosphere is going to have to change a little bit because of this, but not really too badly. Like sites like Gawker are sites that are doing Gawker-like stuff, and I don't necessarily mean at the professional level. I mean like local individuals, everybody's got a couple blogs that they read of people that do the right thing. Add something to the commentary. They're not scraping the content. They're actually basically they're doing interpretation level of journalism. And uh, that's probably going to do pretty well, but you're going to have to see some interesting things. And I already mentioned the Huffington Post and the dig bar thing. The, uh, the other thing that uh, the jury is out on completely is uh, the impact of Twitter. Now, I think I'm probably talking to the right audience when I say that I think Twitter has been overhyped to death. I don't think anybody in this room is going to argue that. If I was at a, yeah, exactly. I don't think anybody in this room is under the illusion that uh, this is actually the second coming of new media. Now, the media, for whatever reason, is doing what they call in media, they call it navel gazing. It's where they start talking about themselves, and it's basically the equivalent of reading somebody doing this. They're looking at themselves and talking about, oh, okay, it's a great, next great thing in media. I think they like it because they get this kind of great impact coming back to them from showing up on Twitter as a news organization. Oh, I got 20,000 followers. I'm awesome. It's great. Well, aside from knowing what kind of ice cream Shaq ate for dinner earlier, uh, the other problem you've got with that is that these numbers are actually not that big. I mean, yeah, an individual with 20,000 followers, that's fantastic, but for a large news organization, it really kind of sucks. Uh, it's, it's not, I mean, if, if you can get it without effort, you're doing a good job, but in general, it's not, I don't know, I don't know that's going to work out. Plus, you know, never mind the fact that nobody knows how to advertise against it. Uh, to me, what I think probably is going to happen with Twitter is, is that somebody's probably going to design a decent third-party app. In fact, one of my jokes about Twitter is, is isn't it funny that the entire thing is wrecked without 30-part app? If, if, you don't, nobody ha if you don't have any way to interpret the data, it's just completely useless. I think somebody's going to get a third-party app, maybe, and for all I know, somebody's done it already, because it seems like an obvious, uh, obvious way to go, to try to collate news events as they occur quicker uh, and get all that together in a more organized fashion. But uh, it, we'll, we'll have to see if that ends up uh, being the case. I don't know. But the, the jury's still out on that. I think what's going to probably happen is Google will buy it and kill it. And uh, we'll be talking about the next thing three years from now. Uh, but anyway, I, I was talking to Joe about how the fact that I, I really didn't have any, like, one of those little, like, you know, at the end of the news story where they always, like, try to get really introspective and, you know, try to tie it all together and make it, like, wow, this is this really hard-hitting impact point. I actually don't have one of those. Uh, so. I can't help you. But uh, I, I think uh, that there will be an interesting new chapter to be talking about uh, next year on this, especially when this AP stuff comes down the line. But I think there are probably some questions. Yes? Oh, uh, what's going to happen with TV and radio, you mean? Yeah. As far as news goes? Well, radio seems to have kind of found its niche, at least for now. I mean, until all the old talk radio fans die, and I think it's going to be a while, because there are a lot of them. Uh, they have learned pretty much how to exist on no money whatsoever. They're all in deep trouble too, but as far from a news standpoint, there's no real actual news stuff going on at radio anymore. They're, they're reading or they're watching other stuff. They turn into basically like podcasts, essentially, this is my personal opinion. Uh, TV news is going to be very interesting because I think they are, local TV news is completely screwed. I don't know what those guys are going to do. I have no idea. There's nothing those guys have to talk about that's of any interest to anybody out there. You write about it already online before they could produce it. It's too slow. It comes out at the wrong time of day. Uh, it's just going to go poof, I think, at some point. They're just going to realize how much money they're spending on this crap and get rid of it. Uh, as far as national TV goes, that'll probably be around for a while. It seems that the ad dollars seem to be holding up, but eventually the same thing that happened in newspapers is going to happen to TV. I think it's on a 10-year lag period, and uh, that's eventually going to catch up. Internet TV is kind of interesting. They have, there's, a, there's a number of things that, I mean, after uh, doing 200 episodes of our own little TV thing, we discovered that uh, it works a lot different. Like right now, what Internet TV is doing is the same mistakes that were made when uh, TV first came out. If you look at old TV, what is old TV? It's guys doing the radio on TV. Well, what is Internet TV? Well, it's guys doing TV on the Internet. Well, what is Internet TV actually going to end up being? It's something completely different, probably. Uh, we don't know exactly what. We did discover in comedy that the way it works is, is that you really can't have anything longer than a couple minutes, and if you don't have your first awesome joke within six seconds, they're gone. So you have to structure it a little bit differently. To give you an example, uh, there was a guy who wanted us to help promote his book. He was a Daily Show writer who did a book on uh, uh, like the, the Practical Man's Guide to Racism. 
about how to be an effective racist. It was actually pretty funny. <laughs> but he had this, uh, had this uh, long three-minute intro to it that he probably could have cut the first two minutes and 45 seconds out of, and he's trying to get me to link this on Spark, and I'm like, man, I was like, if you, you, the last 15 seconds is hysterical. Just start with that. And he said, no, I can't do it, man. This totally works. And well, what he was talking about did work for TV. I mean, if you had actually run that as a skit on The Daily Show, it would have totally worked, no problem. But on the Internet, you know, you're getting two minutes in. If you're lucky, you'd be still there two minutes in, and it still hasn't gotten funny. You're like, yeah, you know what, I don't care about this anymore right here. So uh, that has yet to shake out. There's also the problem of uh, running advertising against it. It hasn't been matured yet, but uh, the guys leading the charge on that, believe it or not, MLB TV. Those guys have got their crap together. Holy crap. I don't know if you guys ever watch that stuff online. I'm kind of like a half-passive baseball fan because my dad's like a huge Red Sox fan. And if I don't know what the Red Sox are doing, we don't have a lot to talk about. <laughs> and, uh, but what, we watch what those guys are coming up with as far as like, the stuff that they're adding. Like right now what they've done is uh, initially they, everybody thought that internet TV, especially sports, was going to be some kind of an interactive TV component where people are going to be like, doing crap the entire time. No, 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 no. People are still lazy. They don't want to do that. But what they do have, though, is they've got little extra things you can click out when you're watching it so you can see stats, uh, other stuff going by, if you are so inclined to, to want to check that stuff out. And I think that's probably more like where it's going to go. And now they've been through every year they add a few things and they take a few things out. And I'm really kind of curious to see where they go with it. But uh, it's still really in its infancy. And the first person that figures it out is probably going to hit it out of the park. The other last comment I'm going to say is, is that uh, the only other trend I'm noticing is that Hulu has proven that content rules, period. Doesn't matter what you package around it or anything like that, if, you, if your stuff is good, people will watch the hell out of it. And uh, that's a lesson, I think, for everybody. Hey, yes. uh, a subject you've treated before has been um, the, how much of a joke a lot of national cable news has become. Oh, yes. And how the solution could be, can you separate the, the phony fluff headlines from hard news, and yet even the, the biggest network that's tried it, CNN, it's still kind of a joke, and the fluff and the Britney Spears crap yep. still winds up on headline news. Is that because people really want it, or they yes. really haven't tried it? What is, the, what is that ever going to fucking happen? That's what it is. It's uh, everybody uh, clicks on that stuff. And like, for example, a great, great recent example, pirates. Who gives a shit about pirates? I don't give a shit about pirates. Nobody else does. But they're kind of cool, if you think about it, right? So if you're going to CNN, you see a bunch of articles about stuff. You woke up in the morning, and you're like, oh, pirates, pirates, what the hell are pirates? Click. <laughs> And check it out. And you read the article, like, okay, great. And then most people are, what's going to happen with the pirate story, by the way, the, long, the short version of where that's going to end up is, is that I saw, like, the afternoon that the guys all came back home. Oh, my God, another pirate attack. Holy crap. Well, if you actually look into the stats about how often pirate attacks occur, that's like, oh, my God, lightning struck in Kansas. <laughs> Can you believe it? And then the next day it happened again. Oh, my God. So uh, they're going to get tired of that really quick. But what they did was the reason that all this pirate stuff hit, again, is because the media started tracking where all the traffic was going online. And they're like, oh my god, people like the pirates. <laughs> they really like this stuff. And this is almost news. So uh, let's, let's talk more about pirates. And I, I haven't seen the could it happen here yet. You know, if I'm driving down I-75 later on tomorrow, is I'm going to get pulled over by you know, some smallies with no shoes on. But I guess we'll see what happens. But so anyway, yeah, the problem is, is that media is seeing that, uh, that it's kind of a compounding issue, but it's a, it's a much longer talk, is that media has discovered that their main product is not actually what people like. People like the news when stuff is going on, but when nothing is going on, they got to fill the space. But I've, that's a whole other completely different talk. I don't see that trend changing. Uh, speak, speaking about pirates, um, I was just wondering, uh, could you comment on the recent events with the Pirate Bay and kind of how search engines are, uh, how the media is prosecuting the search engines and um, how that kind of affects um, where media is going in terms of like the whole Google and AP controversy. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of what I was talking about with the Google News thing. Uh, that's oh. they're they're going after it because I mean they're they're sort of I don't know they're they're barking up the wrong tree. I think Google is actually the straw man that they're not intending to go after. I think they're saying it because they know Google is not going to do anything to them, uh, and they don't really have any attention. The AP doesn't have any attention to go after Google. Google pays the AP for the feeds. Did they get? They're not, Google isn't scraping AP content. They're linking right to it. The AP's got to love that. I think that they're, they're going after them because they don't want to threaten to go after somebody else who's then able to circle the wagons when they see it coming. Uh, the Pirate Bay thing is kind of interesting, uh, too, as well. Uh, I don't know. I heard, I heard somebody say that the, the problem with their defense was is that it was just a tool that could be used, and they said something effective. It was like, uh, I'm going to totally screw the analogy up. It was something like, uh, I forget. I'm not even going to try it. Forget it. It was something about the way you use a hammer to hit a nail on the wall or you know, call somebody over the head and take their car. But anyways, uh, the Pirate Bay thing is, uh, is kind of interesting. I think it, it probably has more to do with the fact that the word pirate appears in the uh, title and it happened to come out this week than anything else. 
the uh, I noticed uh, CNN's getting, getting rid of their space coverage, and it, I've noticed that things that might actually be relevant are being less and less covered. Yes. Uh, what What do you think about that? Like, do you think somebody else is going to pick that slack up? I think so, uh, and I think what's going on is is that uh, they have realized that they're looking at their own traffic patterns, and the reason they're dropping that coverage is not because it's less important than anything else. It's because they've looked at where people go and check stuff out. And people don't really care about the space coverage when you get right down to it. Nobody clicks on that stuff. I mean, it is pretty important, but if you think about what happens on a space mission, the only angle they've been able to come up with is, will the shuttle explode? And if you look at when the shuttle's actually been launched, that's every article. Seriously, check it out the next time. We've got another shuttle getting ready to go up here pretty soon. Check it out. Every single one will be, will the shuttle explode in some way, shape, or form? They'll either be talking about it, you know, like what happened last time, or they'll be interviewing the astronauts and say, Are you, do you feel safe going up into space? Oh, you know, I'm perfectly fine with that. So uh, the, the problem is, is that they cut it. And what we've noticed is, is that uh, there's actually a solution to that, and that is that they're not framing it properly. It's kind of like, uh, it's the same argument can be used in teaching. In teaching, they always talk about how uh, it's the teachers that engage their students and get them interested in the material are the ones that are the most effective. Well, it turns out in journalism, the same thing is true for getting people to click on links. People will click on anything if you can induce them to go. Uh, we actually do that on FARC. Uh, we're trying to send traffic out because it, make, it makes a lot of friends for us. And we have discovered that the way you do it is, is you do not finish the article in the summary. You basically say something like, you know, in Florida today, a man got upset because his wife wouldn't bring him a beer. And when that happens, do you, A, say, go get the beer yourself, B, uh, yell at her until she brings it, or C, do what this guy did. And we won't say what the last thing is, and then you go back and you click through, because you're like, well, what, what did the guy do? And it's in Florida, so you know it involved a shotgun. <laughs> yes? You're talking about them going online completely, yeah. you mean? Yeah, well, and, and the, the history of the organization, I mean, they were founded as a foundation, so they, right. they sort of started uh, from a nonprofit uh, yes. uh, initially. So There's actually another interesting uh, version of that as well. The St. Pete Times um, is a for profit organization owned by a nonprofit entity. Uh, so I actually don't know how those guys are running, but I did think it was interesting that it was, it's been about two years now since they went online solid, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that helped them out a lot because, again, that's a lot of the overhead. It seems like they were trying to do something more intelligent quicker than the other guys, but uh, whether or not it's worked out for them, I don't know. I do know guys over there. I guess I could probably drop them a line and find out how that worked out, but I don't know the answer. Anyone else? Yes? Well, um, I remember, I forget who did it, but there was an article that they done the calculation if the like, New York Times stopped printing newspapers and just sold all the equipment and bought a Kindle for each of their subscribers <laughs> and yeah. gave it to them, that they would save money. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't surprise me. It, it just, do you see a company trying to do something like that, buy them the New York Times cellular device? Yeah, uh, well, the New York Times actually has, I, I've been in, their, in the office where they do this. They've got a four guys that are like gadgeteer guys, and they literally have like a, one version of every single PDA and reader in existence sitting on a couch, including the PS3 and the Wii that they're trying to do different news formats on. Uh, I think the problem, though, the overreaching problem, which probably makes the entire question moot, is it's just too late. Like, had they been considering doing this two or three years ago, maybe, but even if they did that tomorrow, and even if it worked, uh, it's probably too late. Like I said, they just sold their business to make an interest, their building to make an interest payment, and I don't think that's going to work out for them very well at all. Uh, I, will, I do think, though, you're not going to see people buying candles for people, but I think you will see these small guys coming the other direction. They're going to be using these very you know, cheap forms of distribution. And methods of getting other content. I mean, for example, the reason that FARC staff is so small is because we're not really collating the stuff ourselves. We're interpreting it in, in, a, in a comedic context. But what you could do if you're one of these little local uh, all-weekly blogs that starts up for like a million bucks with 10 guys is, uh, and I think, I can't remember who said it. It, it might have been uh, Seth Godin, I think, that said it, where he's talking about the way you fill in your space, your coverages, link out to stuff. Link out to other sites. And to give you an example, and I'll make this my last point because it, it is kind of interesting that most people haven't thought about a lot of uh, news sites have been uh, kind of reluctant to link to each other because over the years there's been this culture of don't mention that there's competition. Uh, I do a local radio show in Lexington every morning. They're actually specifically not allowed to say that there are other radio stations. Now, no, never mind the fact that we all know there are other radio stations. They can't even mention them by name because like, somebody would be like, oh, I, I, didn't, I forgot about those guys. Let's see what they're doing and change the channel. And this has been going on for forever. Newspapers don't mention other newspapers. Uh, newspapers align with certain TV stations. Don't, it, it's, it's ridiculous. What we found out is, is that when you link to other sites, the theory is, in, in journalism, was if you send people off of the newspaper or away from the TV, they're not coming back. We've discovered on the internet 
that it is not, it's completely the opposite. If you take two like-minded sites with different audiences, they will cross-pollinate. Uh, and in particular, case study, sort of, accidentally, my buddy Brooks, who runs Sports by Brooks, runs a sports blog, got something ripped off by Deadspin, one of Gawker's blogs, which is sports also, and he was mad, and he comes to me and complains. Well, I got Nick Dent on IM, so I hit him. I said, hey, Dent, one of your guys stole something from Brooks. Long story short, they ended up talking to each other, and I said, listen, guys, and I'm CC'd on these emails, and they, they hit it off pretty quick. They, things got friendly fast. And I said, guys, you really ought to start linking to each other directly on stories because you will get each other's audiences. We've done this before, but this happened to us the first time back in 2000 or so. And lo and behold, they got them, uh, Fan Nation over AOL, and then somebody else. Four sports blogs started making it made for about one month period, I decided to test and see what would happen if they started linking each other's content over and over again rather than trying to copy it. And they all gained each other's audience. All of them. They all cross pollinated each other. Everybody got everybody's audience. Nobody lost anybody. Because on the internet, if you want to lose customers, the only way you can do it is drive them away. Start sucking. That's it. You can't lose them any other way. Nobody can take them from you. All right, well, I'm out of time. So there you go. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>